Hello, Flat Earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. It's a rainy day here in Phuket. The rainy season is upon us. One thing that dictates or signals the onset of the rainy season is the full moon in April, just after Songkran, which is the water throwing festival, the height of summer, and then, like clockwork, the rainy season starts. Uh, and the moon is usually what is used to tell the time as far as seasonal changes go and these significant, important uh, markings of the passage of time throughout a year. Uh, of course, these days we build cities and roads and things and they all do their part to disrupt the natural uh, flow of weather. But essentially, for the majority of cultures around the world, the moon tells the time. And that's all we need to know about it, really. Um, but, you know, you try and... I've been... I had a debate the other day with a science guy. And, um, you know, gave him the time of day for a while, but eventually it gets heated because you know, you, you, can, you can ask them and explain to them that what they're doing is just describing things based on the assumption that the mass of the Earth is what causes our weight and kilograms are just translated into Newtons and uh, then, you know, the acceleration of an object to the ground through the air is... Well, what, the, what they're doing is measuring, you know, the acceleration. So that's measuring the time. The time. Uh, but of course, what happens in the science guy's head is to him or her, it's very important the correct words are used in this language. So if you try to use terminology that says the same thing you know they don't accept it so what's acceleration you know uh, it, it's it's speeding up over time and of course it's a, or, or, or moving not yeah you see we start to get a little bit uh, it gets a little bit too difficult to describe sometimes but to them, as long as these numbers fit, then they feel they can justify their argument. But really, as I've been saying for a long time, you know, looking at the stars, the moon, the sun, and assuming that the Earth is a ball rotating is simply a way of marking the passage of time. So, of course, what's happened is this idea that um, pushing something along a horizontal and having to use force is also what's happening when something is dropped or rises up. So that's why they have to use the word buoyant force when it comes to helium balloons rising or um, air or something uh, rising in water or something changing weight in water. They have to talk about buoyant force because they are already using a force to describe the downwards motion of something dense in a less dense medium. 
sure, there's an up and down. But, all right, we are traveling along now at a certain speed, and it will take a certain time to get from one marker to another. But someone watching this car go by wouldn't know what was making it move. They can describe the speed, but they can't say really what is making the car go along. That's just, that's how it goes with the movements of the planets and everything and the sun and the moon. They're just marking the passage of time and basing it on the assumption that because the force of gravity based on the mass of the Earth, you see, even this, even when you try to point it out to a hardcore science defender, that gravity, the force of gravity that they are assuming is based on the idea that the Earth's mass is what creates our weight. It confuses them. They, they stop and then, and then it kind of, you know, but you see, and that's the difference with it, with, you know, it's very, very compartmentalized in a, in a, a mathematician's head. Is it, I mean, we're not talking about science, I'm talking about mathematics used to describe the things we see, yeah? But you see, for every little um, event, the mathematician has a little equation. And of course, they talk about forces. And so, and so to them, it all fits. And it must be true. So, in their mind, there is absolutely no alternative to uh, the idea that the Earth is a particular mass. You know, so, they, they base everything on that. But you try to explain to them that, yes, you're using the Earth's density in a specific volume, the globe, to say, that's what gives things weight. That creates the pulling force. And they can't get it. They can't get. They... <laughs> I'm having trouble explaining it myself. But it's so disjointed. Yeah, the, so the flat earther sees the big picture. It's, you know, all these... Um, equations based on assumptions um, don't tell us anything. You know, you, you, you try to explain that if gravity is a force that creates weight and you put something in water, it will actually weigh lighter, which goes against the whole idea of gravity creating weight. Because all the water on top of said object should be like extra weight. But then they go, no, 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 it's all about water pressure. So suddenly it changes to, it suddenly changes to density and water pressure and stuff. You say, well, where's the gravity? Where's the gravity? And they cannot understand that, you know, the water is just like air, but denser. And then start talking about buoyant force pushing it up and things like that. But they only have to do that because they already talked about a force pulling it down. But then, to really mess with their heads, you say, okay, the mass of the Earth in a particular volume or well, the density of the Earth in a particular volume, its mass, the globe, is said to dictate our weight. 
if we were on a more a denser earth then we should weigh more and it takes them a while but they go okay well that, you know that's the whole thing with the moon isn't it the whole moon landing you know the idea was that it's a smaller object less massive so you weigh less i mean they, they forget you just <laughs> So anyway, get that point across. All right. And then and then and then try to explain to them that well, you know, you've got you see they've de de detached from weight being weight and suddenly calling it mass because but they don't understand that it's done that way just to say that we're how we can stick to a spinning ball earth and then you say okay the mass of the earth creates the gravity more mass more gravity so logically When you're in water and you are talking about a buoyant force pushing against the gravity, then a larger mass of water should create more buoyant force. But that's not the case. Cannot wrap their heads around it. And they will insist that they know everything. They will not look at uh, how space has been faked. look at is their equations that's it and then get mad at you for trying to explain you know you they don't get that it's just a description so it's really I mean even if you know someone who is good at maths is considered smart well, you know, anyone can follow a pattern. What about music? You can write music and it is done in a mathematical description. It's broken up into, you know, a bar has four beats and you can break those four beats into eighths, sixteenths, whatever. You can change the time signature. And so you have a description of the music how it should be played. <laughs> but does that explain why we play music? Does it explain the reason for writing the music? So, again, you know, do you, what, what, how do you do it? Do you, do you write the music and then play it? Or do you play the music, then write it? Could go either way. But sometimes you can play music and it's impossible to write. Or you could think of any other way you like to uh, describe in mathematical terms or any other terms. A written language, how to play the music. Yeah? And of course, music is, is just like everything else, whether we're talking about money, the idea of the shape of the earth, gravity, what have you. It's been standardized by these people who wish to control it and say what is or isn't music, what is or isn't your reality, yeah? But then, you know, 
Um, you pick up a Thai instrument, and it's got notes that you can't find in Western music. It's, a, it's another different language. You get different results. You know it's music. Yeah. But to understand, to appreciate, to play music does not require that you are able to write it or describe it. The very act of playing is describing it. It's, it's a creation. The music is a creation. The written music is a description of that creation. Generalized, standardized, so that any old Tom, Dick, and Harry that's studied a bit of music can understand how the music's supposed to sound. But is is someone who cannot write music but can play very well dumb, stupid? Retarded? Thick? Of course not. If they have an ear for music, then it means they have a sensitivity, they have, they have an insight. They have their way of interpreting it. Playing it back. And of course, music played by different, the same piece of music played by different people is never going to sound exactly the same, you know, even if it's written down very, very precisely. There are going to be differences depending on who the player is or who the listener is even, you know, as to what does the music do for you? Does it turn you on? Does it turn you off? Does it, does it give you cold chills? Does it, does it sound like a racket? Does it sound beautiful to you? And of course, anyone can appreciate good music or music that's been, you know, well performed, even if they don't like the music. You can say, well, he's a very good player and blah, blah, blah. So, of course, this single-mindedness that you get with the globe defender who is using maths to defend the globe is, I mean, I, and this is just from personal experience with those people trying to be they, they won't listen. They will not listen to the Flat Earther. They will not accept, they, they, you know, they feel it's their job to teach us dumb fucks. Yeah? And you can try to say that I get it, I understand. All I'm trying to do is to tell you that there's another way you can look at it. But they, they find it impossible. Uh, they, 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 they just cannot do it. They cannot disassociate from this idea that, um, you know, of, of, of gravity being a force. Because that's the only way you can get it to work in the equations. And, uh, you know, the only way you can get the timing to work is by translating it into a force. You can even say, you know, well, look, uh, 10 newtons is the same as one kilogram, right? Thereabouts. 
Well, they'll grudgingly admit that, but we don't talk about it like that, they say. Well, yeah, and so here comes, this is why um, they don't get the idea of um, a disc or an infinite plane, because it's been stuck in their heads that, you know, this center of gravity is in the middle of a sphere. So they figure that you've got to have a center. So if you have, so, you know, with the, this is, I couldn't understand at first where this, um, what's his name? The, oh, where they, they say the flat earth's impossible because then you'd be, as you got towards the outside of a disc, it would be like climbing uphill. And I just couldn't for the life of me understand where they got that idea from. Well, of course, they're, first of all, they're unable to detach from the idea that um, mass creates gravity, and so there must be a central point of gravity that eventually kind of um, gets weaker and weaker as it expands. Um, and so they consider that a disk um, would have a center this guy doing? In fact, that still doesn't make sense because the further away you get from the center, the... Yeah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why they think that. But what I'm noticing more and more is um, that, yeah, it's, uh, it's all compartmentalized, especially when you come to the idea of uh, perspective. For the anti-flat earther, perspective is only the idea that things shrink in size over distance. They do not at all take into consideration how our eyes see the surface rising to meet the sky. This, for them, that's not part of perspective. But it is what you would use if you were going to create a three-dimensional looking image on a 2B, 2D piece of paper. So again, the, ma the mathematician is always thinking about his piece of paper and how to illustrate what we see. And so they, so, you know, they, they say that perspective is only used in art or drawings to represent what we see. But it still doesn't click with them that what we see is three-dimensional and it's perspective. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> excuse me. They have this idea that when we draw these lines of perspective. side view that you know just as we see it's a funny argument it's really really funny you say yeah but look train lines parallel train lines appear to converge at the vanishing line and they're saying yes but those parallel parallel lines never meet and yeah that's the point that's the point but they can't, they, they can't, I don't know. It's very modular, compartmentalized, single-minded, closed-minded thinking. They think they've got it all sussed because they have an explanation, but they simply cannot see how to take a step beyond or a step back 
from the piece of paper, from the equations. And compare it with the real world. It's the biggest problem. They cannot compare it with the real world. Thank you.